you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know that we are finishing up a series that we've been in. We've been calling We Believe as we walk through the foundational beliefs of Christianity. Was it, what is it that makes Christianity what it is? And we've been using as our guide, our topical guide, the Nicene Creed, which some of you have been familiar with. You've grown up saying it in services from the time you were little, and it's maybe breathed a little bit of fresh air into the creed for you. Some of you This has been an entirely new learning experience, and you had no idea there even was a creed. But we've been walking through it bit by bit. Pastor Jack started with God. We believe in one God, and then we began to talk about one Lord, Jesus Christ, one Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And then last week, Pastor Bill talked about the one family of God, the church. And now I get to talk about the one future for God's good world. That's right, we're talking eschatology. Eschatology. It's from the Greek word eschatos. It means last or last thing. So we're talking about the end times. And the reason I got this assignment is because when we were deciding and divvying up the topics, Pastor Bill and Pastor Jack yelled, nose goes really fast. And I was staring out the window and I had no idea what was going on. And so here I am. I make that joke because eschatology has resulted in a lot of heat and not a lot of light when people talk about it, and so it can be a topic of division. And some of you get really excited when you hear the word eschatology, and you want to break out your charts and your Schofield reference Bibles, and you're hoping to hear a discussion about the difference between tri- you know, tri- pre-tribulation, pre-millennialism, uh, and dispensational, pre-tribulation... <laughs> premillennialism and amillennialism and all the rest, and I am so sorry. Uh, I'm going to have to disappoint you this morning because we are going to stay a little bit more zoomed out. Some of you are like, I didn't even know those were English words. What is going on up there? We're going to stay a little bit more zoomed out this morning. Instead, we are going to be majoring on the majors, doing a little bit of what C.S. Lewis might have called mere eschatology. We're going to be focusing on these big ideas that all Christians hold in common when we're talking about the end times or the last things. So some of you are excited, but some of you need a reason to pay attention and not start checking Facebook. So what I want to do is give you that reason with this stick. This is the future stick. Um, If you were to balance a stick like this, this it's just PVC pipe, if you were to balance a stick like this on your hand, the way you would do it is you would leave your palm completely flat and you would maintain it completely still, right? We all agree that that would work. So if I look really hard at my hand, despite all the coffee that I've had, and I would try and keep it perfectly still, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to balance it um, entirely, entirely straight up and down, right? But if instead I get my eyes off of my hand and I look up at the top of the stick, it is relatively simple to keep it going. No applause at all, huh? Interesting. Um, (laughs) So it's relatively simple, it's relatively simple (laughs) to keep it going uh, for a long time because your hand sees where it's going and it adjusts for the direction of of the stick moving. It's a great illustration for a lot of things in life. If you want the journey to go well, keep the end in mind. That's true in relationships. If you want your relationships to go well, ask where is this going? If you want a career that's successful, keep the end in mind. Where are you going if you want your journey to go well? And the same is true with Christianity, the Christian life, following in Jesus. If we want to be faithful and obedient to Jesus now in the present, it is important for us to keep in mind what is coming down the road, what the future is for us and for God's good world. So this morning, I want to give us two focal points of Christian hope, two focal points, two things to set our eyes on. Now, I have to be upfront. both of these things, both of these focal points are said to happen in the Bible. They're said to happen when Jesus returns, and so really what we're doing is we're setting our eyes on Jesus and his return. Christians believe that the same Jesus who lived a perfect life, who died a death on the cross on our behalf and was resurrected from the dead, now has ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God and is the true Lord of this universe. Amen? Amen. Amen. We believe that one day he's going to return. He's going to come back. We call that the the second coming of Jesus. That's what we're looking forward to. And in the creed, in the Nicene Creed, in the discussion about Jesus, it includes this phrase. It says, he's ascended into heaven, and from there he will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. But then the creed finishes up this way. It says, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. 
And those two things are our focal points this morning. The resurrection from the dead and the life of the world to come. So first, the resurrection from the dead. We're looking at 1 Corinthians 15, and what we're going to see is that when talking about eternity, we need to use body language. When talking about eternity, we need to use body language. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me. The entire chapter is a discussion of resurrection. First, a defense of Jesus' own resurrection and its importance for believers. Then, the resurrection of believers themselves. So look at verse 20 with me. It says this, But Christ, that's Jesus, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. Christ, the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So the first thing that we see is that our future resurrection is based on and modeled after Jesus' own resurrection. Paul says that he's the first fruits, which means he's a sample. He's a foretaste of what's going to come later. We learn in Philippians 3, I think it's about verse 20, that Paul says, we await a savior from heaven, and he will come from there, and he will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. And John says it in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. He says, at that time, we will see him and we will be like him. We will be like Jesus. He's been resurrected, we will be resurrected, and we will be sinless as Jesus is sinless. We will then perfectly image God at our resurrection. Our resurrection will be based off of Jesus, but Paul goes on to describe what will our resurrection bodies look like? What will they be like? Verse 35, he says, But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Now, the scientists out there are scratching their heads going, wait, that's not quite right. Seeds don't die before they germinate. Hold on just a second. Paul is describing what it looks like when we take a seed and we, we have to plant it in the ground. It has to be buried before it can grow. And in this passage, he's using these two words, seed and body, to describe the seed is the thing that goes into the ground. The body is the thing that grows up out of the seed. And he's drawing a comparison between planted things and uh, our bodies and resurrected bodies. That's the comparison that's going on. He says in verse 38, to each kind of seed he gives its own body. So he's drawing a connection between what is sown and what is grown. And we get this. We understand this. If you go outside and you plant an acorn in the ground, you get an oak tree. I know you almost, some of you almost said acorn tree, but it's an oak tree. It's an oak tree. If you go outside and you plant an apple seed in the ground, you get an apple tree. That's right. If you went outside and you planted an acorn, you would not expect an apple tree because we understand there's a connection between the seed that's planted and the thing that grows out of it. There's a sameness. There's a continuity. Paul's saying the same thing is true for our present bodies and our resurrected bodies, that there will be a sameness, there will be a continuity. We should, in some way, expect our resurrected bodies to resemble our present bodies. Your resurrected body will really be you. It won't be someone else. We think about Jesus. When Jesus was resurrected from the dead, if he's our model, if he's our, what we're going to be like, then Jesus was recognizable. People knew, oh, oh, it's Jesus. But he was also very different, wasn't he? He had this glorious body and he could do some amazing things. So there will be a difference between our present body and our resurrected body. Paul says there's discontinuity. He says the seed you plant, the thing that's buried, is not the same as the thing that grows. You don't plant an oak tree in the ground. You plant an acorn. So now he's going to go to unpack the differences between our present bodies and our resurrected bodies. Verses 39 through 41, Paul basically says, we shouldn't be surprised that they're going to be of a different glory. We get this. Plants have different glory than animals, have different glory than humans. And then in verse 42, he continues. He says, so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, but it's raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. 
It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So here we see the distinction. Our present bodies are perishable. They're dishonorable. They're weak. We understand this. Our bodies are breaking down. They're corruptible. Some of us know that better than others as we age and we experience pain and illness and and sickness. Where our bodies are like a log that you pick up in the forest that's been sitting there for a while and it's kind of rotting away from the inside and kind of breaking apart. That's what's happening to each and every one of us. Paul says, not so with the resurrected body. It's going to be imperishable, incorruptible. It's not going to break down. It's not going to deteriorate. Now we're subject to sickness. In Wisconsin, it's like five months out of the year, we're all sick. Then we won't be, we won't be subject to sickness, presumably. We'll have these, these powerful bodies. Will we have some of the power that Jesus displayed after he was resurrected? I don't know. I don't know. But our bodies will be powerful and in contrast to our present bodies. They'll be strong, full, vibrant, life-filled. Then Paul says, our current bodies are natural. Our final bodies will be spiritual. And we need to clear up a misconception. Because sometimes people interpret that to mean our present bodies are physical. Our resurrected bodies will be non-physical. But that's not at all what Paul is saying. Because in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, Paul uses those same terms, natural and spiritual, to describe an unbeliever and a believer. He says the unbeliever is natural, same word, and the believer is spiritual. Now, he's not saying the unbeliever is a real person and the believer is a ghost, a spirit thing, right? He's not saying that. He's not saying they're non-physical. He's describing what they're empowered by, what they're animated by, energized by. The unbeliever just has the natural life of human beings, but the believer is empowered by the very Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. So in this passage, he's saying right now, our lives, we're just kind of living this normal life, but finally our bodies will be energized by the very Spirit of God. It's like the distinction between a steamboat and a sailboat. You would not say that the one is made of steam and the other is made of sails, right? It's what they're powered by. So this is a discussion not of composition, but of animation, of the driving force. We will be energized, driven by the Spirit. That leads the Corinthians to ask, okay, so what about people who haven't died when Jesus returns? What's going to happen to them? Paul says, great question. I'll tell you. Verse 51, he says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, meaning we will not all die, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye, at the trumpet, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. And then he says, at that time, death will be swallowed up in victory, and he ends by praising God, and so should we. Amen. We look forward to that day when death is finally gone. This passage has a lot in it, but it makes it clear that when we're talking about eternity, we need to use body language. We need to use body language. And that might challenge you a little bit. If you've thought about eternity as you've imagined what that's going to be like, if you've thought about this sort of disembodied existence floating around in the clouds or something like that, that is not the image that God gives us of our life for eternity with him. It's an embodied existence, a physical existence in resurrected bodies. We will have a resurrection body like Jesus. Now you might be thinking, so what? (laughs) Okay, great. Let's say I believe that. Maybe I don't. But let's say I do. How does focusing on the resurrection from the dead in the future, how does that change now? How do I adjust in the present life? Well, it should, to start with, should give you hope and joy amidst a life that's filled with suffering and pain. Some of us here are in constant pain every day. Some of us have had injuries. We've had a life full of surgeries and difficulties and sadness and pain and sorrow. Some of us are watching our parents wither away and die, or our spouses die of diseases. Not so with the resurrected body. It will be beautiful and incorruptible. Some of us have had injuries in our life or things that have happened where we've thought, thought, we'll never do this again. I'll never run again. I'll never play basketball again. I'll never jog again. Not true if you are in Jesus. You will one day have a fully functioning resurrected body. Not that you'll just escape this physical world, but you will actually get a fully functioning, resurrected body. That should make you excited. That should make you excited. 
I personally get excited by this because I have a body that's been pretty beat up by years of surgeries. I've, I've shared a little bit of that before, and currently I'm, I'm seeing a chiropractor because of all my surgeries, my, my spine is kind of bent sideways, and I, I lean, and I've been, uh, I've been going into this chiropractor. We went in for a checkup and to see how things are. I got an x-ray, and he said to me, uh, hey, you know, we're making some progress. Things, things are looking a little bit better, but, you know, in truth, your spine will never be perfectly straight again. And I knew, what, I knew what he meant, but I smirked and thought to myself, that's what you think. <laughs> that's what you think. Because I'm looking forward to a resurrection body, a body that's not weak, that's not breaking down. That should give us joy in the present. And if the discontinuity, the difference between this body and that body should give us hope and joy, the potential continuity, the potential sameness between our bodies should cause us to take good care of our bodies now and it should cause us to care about what we do in the body here and in this life. Paul's writing to the Corinthians and some of them are thinking that what they do in the body doesn't really matter because what matters is their immaterial soul, the spiritual side of them. So they can engage in all these illicit sexual relationships because it it just isn't that big of a deal. It doesn't matter. And especially in chapter 6, Paul says, no, that's not the case at all. What, what you do in the body matters. After all, the same Jesus who was raised, the same God who raised Jesus, will raise our bodies. We're going to be resurrected after all. It matters what you do in this life, in this body. So take care of your bodies and watch what you do in your body. We are not simply immaterial souls that inhabit a body for a time. We are ensouled bodies. That's part of what it means to be human. What we do with our bodies matter. So remember, when talking about eternity, use body language. Use body language. That raises all sorts of questions. Some of you are thinking, okay, that's great that I might have a resurrected body at the end of time, but I want to know about my wife who died this past year. I want to know about my grandma or that person, my friend, who died knowing Jesus, what are they experiencing now? There's whole sorts of other questions that are raised. Some of you are thinking, okay, if we're going to have bodies, does that mean, does that mean we're going to eat? Does that mean we're going to, like, drink? Does it mean we're going to play ultimate frisbee? Maybe you're thinking that, or maybe that's just me thinking that. If you have a bunch of uh, questions, which you should, about this, I just want to recommend a book to you. This is by Randy Alcorn, and it's upside down. It's by Randy Alcorn, and it's called Heaven, he goes in depth into a lot of those conversations, going off of what the Bible says. He speculates or tries to discuss what, what might be the answer to some of those difficult questions about some of the details. So pick that up, or I think you might be able to find it on you know, an electronic version. Um, all those questions raise another question, where is this all going to take place? Where are we going to have resurrection bodies? And that brings us to our second focal point, the new heavens and the new earth, which we're going to look at in Revelation 21. Revelation 21, we see the new heavens and the new earth. And what we need to know about the new heavens and the new earth is that while heaven is important, it's not the end of the world. While heaven is important, it's not the end of the world. And let me explain what I mean by that. In God's story, the story from Genesis to Revelation, creation, the physical world, is the setting of the story. It is not the problem. Let me say that again. In God's story, from Genesis to Revelation, creation, the physical world, is the setting of the story. It is not the problem. God created everything good in the beginning. And then he made humans, and humans, the first man and woman, messed everything up. They rebelled against God, and because of their sin, this entire world, this entire universe, was plunged into corruption and decay. But sometimes we tell the story as if the next thing that God did was to launch plan B, where he made a way for humans to escape this physical world and go live with him one day in a floaty cloud palace. Sometimes... Sometimes we tell the story as if the final destination for human beings, God's goal for them, is to die and to go be with God in heaven. And that's partly true. That's partly true. And I want to be clear. I believe, and the Bible clearly teaches, that people who die believing in Jesus immediately are entering into the presence of God. They immediately enter the presence of God. Jesus says to the thief who's dying next to him on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Paul says to the Philippians in chapter 1, he says, look, I don't know if I'm going to make it out of prison. I might die here. But if I don't, that's okay because to depart and be with Christ is better by far. 
So if you have family members, if you know people who have died knowing Jesus, you can take great comfort in knowing that they are in bliss in the presence of God right now in heaven. This is a really great comfort for me because my grandma Nancy died last year, about a year ago on Good Friday. My first grandparent to die, and it came really fast, and it was sudden, and it, and it took us all by surprise. And we had had a lot of conversations leading up to her death, even though we didn't know she was dying, about her relationship with Jesus, and she expressed this hope and this trust in Jesus. She was looking forward to meeting Jesus. I got to stand up at her funeral and tell my entire family that now Nancy knows Jesus better than she did before. She's in God's presence, and she is rejoicing. So you can take comfort and joy. If you have family members, if you know people who have died, they are currently with Jesus in heaven away from this world. But that's not where they're going to stay. That's not where they're going to stay because God is going to do something incredible with this world. And we see it in Revelation 21. The book of Revelation is intimidating to some people because there's a lot of confusing imagery in it. It it sort of works like this. Chapters 1 through 3 are letters. Chapters 4 through 5 is a vision of the throne room of God. Chapters 6 through about 19 have all the things that you've maybe heard of, the, the seals and the trumpets and the bulls and the beasts. And then at the, all these things, sort of the suffering leading up to Jesus' return. And then in chapter 19, we get this depiction of Jesus' return. Not coming as a suffering servant, but coming as a victorious king on a, on a white horse. And he defeats evil for good. And then he brings about the resurrection from the dead in chapter 20. That's what we talked about, the resurrection from the dead. The, the dead are judged before God on the basis of their lives. They're judged before God. And then we get chapter 21. And this is what John sees. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Then we get a description of the dimensions of the new Jerusalem, but we pick it up in verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gate ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me a river of water, the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. It's beautiful. It's not the only depiction of the new heavens and the new earth. In the Bible, we've got Isaiah 65 and 66. 2 Peter chapter 3 talks about the new heavens and the new earth, but this is probably the most comprehensive vision, the most beautiful vision, tying so many things together. 
First, we notice that the, it's a new heaven and new earth. And that does not mean a new dwelling place of God and a new dwelling place of people. That's a description of the known universe, the physical universe, the sky and the land. God's remaking the entire world. He's remaking the entire universe. We see the new Jerusalem descending and coming down out of heaven, and God dwells with people on the earth. No temple is needed. No building is needed to mediate God's presence because he is present with his people. We hear echoes of the Genesis 1 and 2. We, we see the tree of life and we hear this tantalizing description that there will be no curse from Genesis 3. This corrupted world that you and I live in, that's not how it's going to be in the new heavens and the new earth. It's going to be purified of all sin, purified of all corruption. No more tears, no more sadness, no more death, no more pain. And then sadly, we read that those who are judged in chapter 20 of Revelation, the wicked, the unbelieving, the evildoers, will not get to experience this blessed renewal of the universe. They will not get to experience the new heavens and the new earth. Instead, they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire, this place that the Bible elsewhere calls hell, eternally separated from God. Now all this imagery can leave us debating and imagining what exactly is it going to look like? What exactly is it going to be like? And we can do that. We can imagine, we can discuss and debate, but one thing I think we can be sure of is that it will be here and not somewhere else. I heard one pastor say it like this. He said, when you trust Jesus, you don't just get a one-way ticket to heaven. It gets you a round trip there and back again. A Christian's tale. <laughs> There and back again. It will be a new earth, not a new Mars or a new Tatooine, for those of you who like Star Wars, a new Yavin or a new Naboo. It's going to be a new earth, so it should bear and it will bear some resemblance to this present earth. Just as our present bodies will have a resemblance to our resurrected bodies. When imagining what is it going to look like, start looking around at the world around you and saying, what would this look like if it was renewed? We might think of a car that's been restored that had rust all over it and it had the rust scraped out and the dents, you know, fixed and it's polished and shiny. That is how our earth will be. It'll be renewed. There'll be newness to it, beauty and glory. It's going to be wonderful. The important thing to remember is that our final dwelling place after Jesus has returned is a physical place. It's not a floaty cloud palace in the sky. It will be a new earth. Heaven is important, but it's not the end of the world. Heaven is important, but it's not the end of the world. So as we think about what sorts of things we will do for eternity, we should not imagine that we're just going to do spiritual things, like reading our Bibles, or praying, or meditating. How many of you have ever thought, if heaven is going to be like one long worship service, I'm going to be totally bored, right? <laughs> We've all thought that at some point. Yes, we have. We can be honest about that. I think we're going to have things to do. God gave Adam and Eve work to do in the garden. I think we're going to have projects to work on. I think we're going to create things. We're going to design things. We're going to build things. I think we're going to have to study and learn. There's no hint in the Bible that we become omniscient, all-knowing, when we're resurrected. So I think we're going to have to, to learn. I think there's going to be whole new areas of study. What does resurrection biology look like? I don't know. Maybe you can get a PhD in resurrection chemistry. Who knows? I think we're going to have things to learn. I think there's going to be things for us to do. We're going to dance without hip pain with resurrected bodies. We'll be able to dive playing ultimate frisbee without fear of losing a kidney. Long story there. <laughs> In short, I, I, we can't know for certain. We don't know exactly what things are going to be like, but we should not imagine sitting through a 50 billion year long church service. I'm sorry. I think there's going to be things for us to do. So maybe you're saying, okay, so what? So what? If I keep my eyes focused on this focal point, how, is that, how, is that gonna, how am I going to adjust in the present? How is that going to make a difference in my life? Well, first of all, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, these chapters of Revelation should not be exciting to you. They should be terrifying. Because here are some of the most vivid depictions of what awaits people who don't know Jesus when he returns as king. Right now, Jesus is patiently and lovingly waiting and inviting everyone, trust in me, worship me, receive the forgiveness that I'm offering, bow down to me. But one day, 
every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord without exception. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, this present earth in all its corruption is the closest thing you will ever get to paradise. And so I just I urge you, please, turn to Jesus. Trust him. Say, I'm done running my life. I don't want to be in charge of my own life anymore. I want you to be Lord. I, I need the forgiveness that you offer. I'm sorry for all the things that I've done. Forgive me. Come into my life. Transform me. If you do that, I promise you, it will be worth it now and for eternity. And if you're here this morning and you are following Jesus, then this should, this should light you up. This should get you excited, excited enough to tell people about Jesus. We've got good news to share. Isn't this good news? We should be going around telling people about this great salvation that God has given us. But it should also give you value in the present work that you do in this world. When Jesus returns, he's not just going to crumple up the physical universe and throw it in the garbage. He's going to renew all things. He's going to recreate this physical world. And so when you work hard and when you create and when you cultivate things, you are doing things that are not necessarily going to cease to exist in the new heavens and the new earth. We're going to need skilled people. So build good houses, right? Build, design good motorcycles. Build good web apps. Lawyers, you might have to find a new trade. <laughs> but you will have 50 billion years to do it, to learn a new trade. What we do in this life now, in the physical world, it's good. It's good work. We should see that as valuable. God will redeem and restore and renew this physical world. And we don't want to speculate. We don't want to go on much beyond what the Bible says. But I think God's given us an imagination so that we can cultivate hope for the future. And too often, our imaginations have been captured by Dante's Inferno or the Enlightenment philosophy when we think about heaven. And instead, we need to get back to what the Bible says about this stuff. We need to recover a robust vision of God's future for the world. So there you are, two focal points, focusing on Jesus and these focal points as we walk together through this life, adjusting our way, trying to remain obedient to him. Again, we can't know exactly what things will be like, but I think it's worth finishing with this quote. Uh, by a man named N.T. Wright. He's a pastor and theologian. He says, All our language about the future is like a set of signposts pointing into a bright mist. The signpost doesn't provide a photograph of what we will find when we arrive, but a true indication of the direction we should be traveling in. But thankfully, we have someone who approaches us out of the mist, the resurrected Jesus who says, This way, follow me. Let's pray.